I teach in home language, SPs and FETs. Yes, it's the 2nd of April, it's Sunday. And this is the Herald to Week 4 um, speaking skills and listening skills. These are going to be two recordings. 4.1 is going to be about listening skills. This is particularly important for the SPs who are going to be doing a lesson plan design for listening. And the speaking one is going to be especially for the TFETs um, because they can do the lesson plan on a prepared formal speaking activity. But both are important. Um, also, the listening will be for the forum discussion for the SPs, whereas the FETs are going to have a speaking forum discussion. So that's the differentiation. But speaking and listening are important for both of you. So you're welcome back into my study. Here we are. I'm trying to rearrange the book so it looks like a different place. Um, this is my social research books. Um, this is understanding organizational behavior, believe it or not. And this is research in education methods. So um, lots of books to enrich our teaching careers especially language teaching careers. So without further ado, let me get to sharing my PowerPoint with you. Here we go. Yes, there we go. And let's get the screen up. There we go. Yes, listening practices and resources. So this PowerPoint is going to, first of all, look at listening practices, um, how we teach listening pedagogically. And then we look at a few listening practice resources. It's week 4.1. There'll be a 4.1 and a 4.2. Um, yes, how well are you listening? Or are you not listening? I don't know which one we are best at. I think often it's going to be the not listening type of person. Okay. Right, um, we've done this. We've looked at the, the Kahoot quiz and we want to again say thanks to uh, Miss Aesop who came number one, and then Amy and then Caitlin. Caitlin, thank you for your work, but I'm saying thank you to all who actually took part in the Kahoot quiz that goes right back to week one. Okay. Yes, um, do you have Ferreira? I see now we've got 72 that have responded to this with 51 of you actually having your Ferreras and 21 acknowledging that they don't have Ferreira. I'm just not too sure how you're going to be able to continue if you're not making a plan to get Ferreira. Okay, maybe you've got a good friend that is lending the book to you as well. So yes, still concerned about that. Um, week one tasks. I go and check this periodically and I see the numbers have increased with 68 of you actually having completed the week one tasks. Okay, I'm going to close this. I won't mention this again, but I think there's about nearly 200 of you all together. So that means there's only a, maybe just over a third of you have actually done these tasks as well. So please try and keep up with these. The menti tasks are so easy. It won't take you more than 30 seconds. Don't be scared of them. There is going to be another one on listening as well. If you go into week four, you'll see the menti. How do you show good listening skills? And once you've watched this recording, it'll be quite easy to find out what they are. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, <laughs> the I'm just putting this in here because the TEFFs have still done nothing. I'm not too sure TYTF has not answered any of these. Possibly they've become confused or they just don't know how to work the link. I'm not too sure. If somebody could tell me again why you're not doing this, I'd love to know. Okay. Yes, let's look at the um, stats for now. Um, as you can see, you've moved week one, the reflection task, you've moved out of the red and um, 58 of the 88 um, students have actually submitted. I think the two or three that were late registrations that will still submit, so maybe about 61. Maybe some of you are just choosing, you don't really need to do it. Um, and there are now 103 SPs and 70 have done it. And I think there might be two or three also submitting late. I can see quiz two and quiz three, people are working on that already. Um, they're still in the red because 31 FETs have done the, the multiple choice curriculum document um, online tracking quiz and 36 of the SPs, but I'm sure those are all going to be completed by tonight, which is the 2nd of um, second of April already. Here we go. Um, whereas quiz three is the 9th. I know it's the Easter weekend. Try and get it done beforehand. And all of you know, obviously know that SS1 is due on Tuesday for SPs and Thursday for the FETs. Okay, well done. Yes, um, we'll see how we go with that scary face. Okay, lesson plan design is your next assignment. It is going to be in week four. You'll be able to access the templates, um, submission, and everything else. But I'll be speaking about lesson plan design and rubrics 
in week five. So hang in for that as well. And there'll also be um, an SS2 overview for you as well. I'm um, giving you the details of actually submitting your assignment. Yes, 9th again for the SPs, 11th of May for FETs, also on Turnitin, the same as you've done for SS1. I'm going to try and bring down your reports to 20% because most of this should be your own work on how you are design, deciding to use and access the TED Talks that you have and how you're going to implement them in your lesson. I don't think you can get this off the internet. You have got to design it. So remember for the FETs, you're also going to be a formal speaking lesson plan. And for SPs, it's going to be a listening speaking plan. Two different things shouldn't be the same at all. This looks at the FETs again. This is again, this, is, this template is on um, Canvas week four. You can go and access it. Again, the FETs, it's a formal speaking, the preparation and presentation of um, speaking. I'm going to be teaching speaking about this in my next um, recording in week 4.2. Um, you've got to use a text-based approach. You've got to use the TED Talk. Here it is, the 110 Techniques of Communication and Public Speaking. Looking at a TED Talk, what it says about public speaking, inductive means it's discovery. Whereas the SPs, you're going to look at the power of language policy in multi multilingual South Africa. It's going to be a listening activity. It's also going to be text-based, based on the, the TED Talk and inductive. Inductive just means the students have got to discover. You can't be teacher telling them all the time. They've got to find out something. For instance, does texting cause accidents on your phones? Okay, so they've got to find out, does it or doesn't it? So they've got to do something. The teacher can't just do the whole lesson telling them what to do. In addition, you're also going to have a little bit of recording in preparation for SS3, which is a workshop that you're going to present as a recording. So this is just a little sample of how to record and submit on Canvas. Um, and it's going to be a video clip of five to six minutes of how you will present the conclusion to your lesson plan design, whether it's listening or it's a formal speaking one. Okay, I'm going to see you teaching. You're going to teach me. Okay. Right, so let's go back what we are doing now. We've looked at the CLT approach for unit two, um, but for the next, for this week, we're going to look at listening, we look at oral, and we look at resources to do with listening and speaking. So that's all going to come up in this week, week four. See chapters eight, that is about listening in Ferreira, and chapter nine is about speaking in Ferreira. So it's all there as well. Um, the assessing um, rubrics will all happen next week with the lesson plan design as well. All right. So then by the end of next week, week five, we will have finished unit two. Week six, we will start unit three, the reading section. So when you have a speaking or listening exam, what, what, is, what is important Okay, for that? And here's a word cloud that we've got here. And you can see practice. Okay, when you're speaking, it doesn't just happen. You've got to actually go and practice it. You've got to know all the skills needed for nonverbal language when you are presenting, the need for eye contact, engaging this audience, the pitch, the being clear, your tone, your pausing, your body language, how you stand, all important. But within listening, yes, your body language is also important. And we're going to look at that today as well. What do we, how do we have to be with our bodies to be good listeners? Okay. Right. So how do you listen? This is Lucy Brown and Charlie, you are like. Lucy and Charlie Brown, um, the Peanuts classics. And if you look in the first frame there, it says, Lucy says to Charlie, so what do you think? She says to him, and he says, what difference does it make? You never listen anyway. Do you actually, I sometimes I feel a bit like that, like Charlie. In the second or the middle frame, she says, I was just trying to make conversation. So she, he says back to her, when you make conversation, you have to listen too. And she says, you do? Right. And we often like Lucy. We don't like to, we like to talk all the time, but we don't like to listen and respond appropriately because we're too busy thinking about what we're going to say, which is all about ourselves. So we're often bad listeners. Yes, look at our body language in these, in these images I've got here. He's trying to teach this poor man. He's presenting something. She's staring at her screen. The other one's fiddling with her hair, dreaming about what she's going to do that evening. And the other one is totally bored, looking down at the table, not making eye contact. Or are we a bit like this, obsessed with our screens? I mean, look at a bit screen addiction just now in the resources. All students will relate to this because I think they all have this 
addiction um, with that, with their screens, or they they're in love with their screens and they are fascinated by them as well. Look at that. That is not listening at all. Yes, there's another one. The body language. His feet are right next to her, so there should be some kind of contact. And she's saying, "Is he listening?" And she's saying, "Blah blah blah blah." Zzz, he's falling asleep. His body language shows he's not listening. He's got his hand by his head. His eyes are shut. Um, he's slouched down. He's not making any listening contact with her. So often we will just pretend that we are listening. Yes, so now how do you show good listening? So this brings me to my next mentee. Sometimes we forget to listen. So what I want you to do is go to week four and click on the mentee there. Um, how do you show good listening skills 2023? Enter one word and enter another word. So how do you, you could put a phrase there as well. Enter a word and another word. Two things that you think show that you are listening to someone. Okay. Here's a checklist. How often do you, when someone is speaking, decide that the topic is boring? Okay. You don't like it. So you think it's boring before they even speak. You criticize the speaker. They speak too fast. They speak too slowly. Uh, they don't know what they're speaking about. And that means you're not listening. You overreact by disagreeing with the, the speaker. Okay. Or you only listen for facts. You don't want to listen to anything else. You don't listen to these stories. You just want the facts. So what happened? Okay. Um, you find it hard to decide what's important. Why are they telling me all this? You fake attention. You nod and you smile, but you're not really listening. You give into distractions. You look what's happening outside. You wonder why it's so hot in the room. You look at the clock. You listen to the noise. You're not wondering why that car is hooting outside. You don't listen to what's happening in the room. You avoid listening to them, something that's difficult. I, I don't really like this topic. It's too hard for me. I'm not going to listen. Maybe it's the maths class. I don't know. Maybe it's the English class that you don't want to listen. Um, if someone uses a word you don't like, you get all emotional about it and you decide you're not going to listen anymore. Uh, they use this word instead of that word. So therefore, I'm not going to listen to them anymore. So I don't like that word. Um, or you waste speed your thought speed by daydreaming about something so you're not processing the information you wandering down the zambezi on your boat and you're not really worried about what they are saying so how often i'm sure most of us can say we've done about eight or eight of these 10 or maybe 10 out of 10 yes that's how we listen the frustration of the person when someone's not really listening to you there's your best friend she's trying to give you this interesting conversation Look at your body language, look at your eyes. What are you busy doing? Okay, to show your attention. So, just some facts about listening. You're, if you use images in your class, that's why I often bring images in. It goes into your long-term memory, whereas words live in your short-term memory, so sometimes they're forgotten very quickly. It's this jumble, this mess that's in your head. But if you show a picture, somebody will often remember it because we are quite visual in how we remember things. So, blah, 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 the words are not going to be remembered, but often the verbal, the non-verbal, the picture, the body language will be remembered. So if you're going into an interview, what will they remember about you? 55% will remember your body language. How did you sit? How did you lean? How did you shake hands? How did you smile? What are your facial expressions? And the other 38% will be the actual how you speak. You've got a deep voice. Um, you speak well. People remember that, but they won't actually remember your words. 7% of what you actually say will be remembered as gained into the short-term memory, not the long-term, but they will remember how you sat and how you sounded with a lovely deep voice or you were, you were very friendly, you were smiling. Um, those things will be remembered. They say often they'll only remember your first sentence and your last sentence, so make sure those are good if you're going in for an interview. So let's listen, think about listening process. What happens when we're listening? Well, first of all, someone speaks. And then the message has got to get to the listener and go through external interference. That might be a noise in the background. It might be children screaming. It might be a bell ringing. It could be all those things happening, which will prevent somebody from, from hearing. Then there's also the internal interference, like my emotions. Um, I'm not feeling very well. Um, I'm thinking of something else. I'm distressed about this. I'm anxious. All those things will prevent us from hearing. Okay, if you're anxious about anything, and that stops the message going through. If it can get through the external and the internal interference, that's actually going to help to go into the hearing. So the sound waves will start penetrating there. And if you've got good hearing, it'll go through. 
It's only when it reaches attention, when you start selectively attending to those sounds, what is that person actually stay, saying? Can you repeat that? I think I missed that part, okay? So you pay attention. That leads to understanding. That means you start interpreting what they're saying and evaluating it. Then it leads to remembering, storing that memory, meaning, sorry, and then goes feedback to the source. When you give feedback, people will then see that you are responding. So if you never respond to people, there's no feedback. So people aren't really sure that you are really listening. Okay, that feedback is important. So if you look at this process from the receiving leads to understanding, remembering, then you evaluate and then you get the feedback. So you've got to go through this process to show listening. So what is hearing? Hearing is quite passive. If you've got ears, you should be able to hear. You don't do anything to make yourself hear if you've got proper hearing. Sound waves go into your ear, stimulate the sensory receptors in your ear, and therefore you, you hear. Blah, 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 blah. People are speaking. You can hear. However, listening is a more active thing. You're not just sitting there doing nothing. You're actually doing something with it. It's a purposeful and systematic response to the messages and we often do that by paraphrasing what the speaker said asking questions making notes um, asking them to repeat those kind of interactions show that we're actually listening is purposeful active responses that we're giving because we are processing that information if we're just hearing we do nothing we're passive I hear you, but I'm not listening. So that's what often happens. We hear the sounds coming in, but you're not listening because you're not actively processing that information. So in school, interestingly enough, listening is spent 45% of our time. This is what you do now. You're listening to me drone on. 45% of the time you are listening in school. You're often not even taught how to listen at school. Uh, then, sorry, then we go on to um, speaking. 30% of the time you speak at school and you're often trained in speaking. 16% is reading and you're often trained in reading those skills. Only 9% on writing. Not much effort is put into writing. So if you think about what happens at school, most of the time you are listening, okay, or you're speaking. However, we learn 85% from active listening. So if we're listening properly, using that 45% to listen actively, we can learn a lot in the classroom and in life as well. Look, look at the different speeds, um, if you think about it. Speaking, listening, reading, and comprehending speeds. We speak at 133 to 88, 188 words a minute. That's what I'm doing now, about 188, maybe 190. However, you can listen at a fastest rate, 125 words to 250 words a minute. So even before I'm at this place, you know what I'm going to say. You've worked it out because you can listen faster than I can speak. Your reading is even faster. That means you've read this whole page already because you can read at 200 to 230 if you're an average reader. If you are a um, postgrad like you all are, it should be 300 to 400 words a minute. You've already read this. You've comprehended it and you know what I'm going to say because you are comprehending with your amazing brains at 600 words a minute. So that means you only need a quarter of your brains for listening. Okay, 125 to 250, you can actually provoke things out at 600 words a minute, even faster than I'm speaking, even faster than you're reading. So because you're only using a quarter of your brain for listening, you are, if you're not using active listening, you're not going to be learning very much but you can learn 85% of what you know through listening as well if you use your comprehending speeds as well. So we have to activate how do we comprehend more than what we're actually hearing passively, okay? And these are the tips we're going to look at. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So remember I said you need body language to be an active listener as you need to be a good speaker. You've got to use your ears, your eyes, your mouth, your hands, and your body. Um, so it'd be, you've got to be a whole body listener, your body language, you've got to have your brain thinking, your eyes looking at the person, making eye contact, your mouth quiet, you can't talk and listen at the same time, your ears actively hearing, making sure there's no distractions, shoulders facing the person, your hands still, and your feet calm. Okay, I'm going to try and access now a YouTube, it's about a minute, but if, I, if, I, if it flops, don't worry about it, we'll just leave it. So I'm going to stop my share of the PowerPoint and I'm going to
go to share screen and I'm going to go to my little active listening YouTube. That's going to work now. Okay. Let's go. Don't listen to other people. Instead, we just think and wait for our turn to express our own opinion. Take a step back and look at your colleagues' conversations. It's likely it'll look more like two monologues where everyone tells about themselves. The cure for it is active listening. It's a very powerful skill. It brings people closer, builds trust, and helps people to open up. Here are five steps on how to do it. One, stay focused, keep natural eye contact, don't judge, and be patient. Two, really listen. Don't think about your similar experiences and what you should tell next. Three, allow for periods of silence. Wait till the other person speaks again. Four, from time to time, repeat the other person's words or paraphrase it back to them. It will reassure that you really listen and encourage them to open up. Five, understand the emotions behind the words. When you paraphrase, also try to express the other feelings back to them. Active listening is rather difficult and can be more tiring than talking itself. Be prepared for long conversations. On the other hand, you will gain trust and people will simply like to spend time with you. You will also understand them much better. At the beginning, try it with your spouse or a good friend. You'll see how great they feel after talking to you. If you want to learn more about Optimal Lifestyle, subscribe to our channel below. Okay. This is Monday sale, CRM, an intuitive that. CRM that helps you actually close deals. Oh, Say hello to Michael, one of our new leads. Easily qualified. Okay, let's go back to sharing my screen. This is a bit, all the technically challenged people that I am sometimes. Okay, here we go. Yes, you'll be back where we were before. So this is the two links are here. There's a YouTube one on the left side, and there's the YouTube one that I've just played now for you on active listing on the on the right hand side. So you can go and actively check that out again if you want to. Okay, let's go on to my next slide. Is that one? Okay, let's look at deliberate listing strategies. So we're going to use the 85% so we can actually understand what we are listening to for the quarter of our brains. How can we actively do this? So we're going to focus on understanding and analyzing information what people are using. So we do that by taking notes. Remember, if you're doing the um, SP lesson design, this is one active listening type of activity you can have in the class, taking some kind of notes, asking questions of the learners, analyzing what is being said, and summarizing or paraphrasing. So these are active listening practices that you can use in your class exercises. Okay, so these are strategies that you can also use to, in, to connect with the speakers. You must make eye contact. If you look in a way you're not showing in terms of body language that you are listening to someone. Have a receptive climate. Make sure there's no distractions. The doors are shut. There's, um, it's not too hot in the room. That Their students are not doing other things. Their screens are, are off. They've got no cell phones with them. So it is receptive to listening. Those distractions, get rid of them. Smile and nod, okay? That's how you show you're listening. Um, and you have a very warm facial expression on your face. You haven't got a severe or angry facial um, expression. And that shows that you're connecting with the speaker. So when you nod and smile at me, I think you're listening, but you could be faking that as well. So what does CAP say about listening? It says learners must be able to listen for information um, and enjoyment. That's spe specifically for SPs. Um, for information as well, for FET, but it's more different kinds of longer pieces of listening, um, more critical, um, those uh, judging, analyzing. And then also being able to respond appropriately to that information. When I give you information of how you get to the next, to the supermarket, you should be able to say, oh yes, I know where it is, it's near that street. Or critically, no, I don't agree with it because that's the wrong way to get there. All right. So learners need to weigh up and evaluate that information that they're listening to. Um, not take everything at face value. That's the wrong directions. That is not how you do that. All right. So they must be critical about it. And so we continue this whole thing about critical thinking and not just accepting everything. The end of caps and listening. 
You've got to integrate listening into all lessons. Remember that we have an integrated type of approach to English now. It's not just all writing or grammar or, or speaking. We use listening, speaking, reading, and comprehending, um, as well as visual literacy as well, all comes in together. So if you're doing intensive listening, that means really listening critically. They have to listen to details and close attention of that whatever is happening. So if you think of directions or instructions, they have to listen to those details. Otherwise, they will not know how to do something. If it's more overall for summarizing, it's more global listening, it's to get a general idea of what the person was speaking about. Um, CAPS also has the different stages in the class that you're going to use in the lesson for listening. Um, and if you think about listening, you've got to have the pre-listening, that's about six minutes of your lesson. The during lesson is going to be the most intensive part of the listening exercise. And then post listening, post listening, it's a task you're going to do at the end. Caps also says you've got different kinds of listening that you do in the class, um, including listening for specific information. How many times, what kinds of fruit were listed in that listening exercise? Critically analyze why the boy didn't like mangoes, perhaps, okay, and evaluate his reasons or just appreciation or something just interesting to listen to about um, why, why students love their screens so much or why they take silly selfies. Those kinds of things are looked at for appreciation and understanding and to interact and discuss it as well. So still with CAPS conducting a listening lesson, there's the pre-listening stage. As I said, this is about three to six minutes. Please use authentic, relevant materials. And you use these to probe prior knowledge and opinions. So I'm, I'm still keeping with silly selfies. Um, if you bring in selfie pictures, students will relate to that straight away and you can probe their prior knowledge on selfies and get their opinions about selfies. Should people take selfies when they are driving? Okay, might be about this whole dangerous selfies type of thing. Um, and you can use authentic materials to make it relevant, to establish what they know. If they've got no idea of what selfies are, by slim chance, I think, um, then you have to make sure that knowledge is cultivated so you can link to other aspects in the actual lesson. So ask them questions about the topic. That's one of the most direct ways you can do it, but you can also do it by showing them a whole lot of visuals um, or ask them to share experiences about um, their selfie experiences. Um, I can't take selfies. I've got this stupid arm and I can't, I'm a bit dyslexic, I think, when it comes to fingers, I can't actually take it properly. So my granddaughter is quite amazing. She seems to have these long arms and she can take the amazing selfies. So that's one of my experiences, but get them to talk about it as well. Okay, all those questions and shared experiences. One way to do this is quite interesting. I got into such big trouble one time when. Okay, so if you want to use this kind of questioning technique, um, I got into trouble when I did this. Okay, so you can start this going around the class and this is how you talk about trouble and going to detention, getting punished, um, failing your exams and so on. And there's also a link at the bottom, the teachingstudio.com. Um, teaching and speaking and listening tasks as well. So for instance, you had to go to the, the principal, here's a picture. They will soon understand this whole idea, or maybe students don't go to principals anymore and they're not punished anymore. Um, what do teachers do in the class to punish their students? I don't know. Maybe this is something to talk about. This is what someone put on a text message. She was sharing what she got into trouble with in class. She actually got into trouble because I wasn't allowed to go to recess, that's break, because I read ahead in the English textbook. So she was reading ahead and she got into trouble, wasn't allowed to go to break. Um, what did she do? I spent it in the classroom. You guessed it, reading, no regrets. Okay, so this was punishment, but it wasn't really punishment for her. Okay, so those kind of things are for your pre-listening. How do you establish an understanding of getting into trouble at school and getting them to share experiences? So during listening stage is the longer part of your lesson with the teacher activities, the student activities. Remember for your lesson plan design, they must be inductive, text based. That means they must discover something. You mustn't tell them everything as teacher. So they engage with the listening material, whether it's a TED talk that you have got for the lesson plan design or looking at the different pictures. 
if it's a text you're giving them, they must read it once or they must listen to it once or many times, depending on what you feel is appropriate. And activities that motivate learners are, I'm going to give you some examples of these, are true and false questions. As they are reading through, you've got true and false questions or multiple choice questions or ticking items on a list. What fruits were mentioned in this, in this listening comprehension? And you can have lots of fruits and they need to tick as the fruits are mentioned in the listening comprehension. Post-listening is at the end. Um, it's a discussion of the learner's answers. It's to review any kinds of problems they experienced in listening, what was problematic for you. They might say, ma'am, we only listened once, we need to listen again, or it was too long, it was too complicated. Um, and then you've got to assess this listening not only leaving it there, but in conjunction with some kind of output that could be speaking. So they've listened, now they've got to speak, they've got to role play something. They've, give, they've got to give an oral personal response to that listening comprehension that they are, they've listened to, or they've got to write something. So in the post-listening stage, for those of you doing SPs, you've got to assess the listening by some kind of task at the end of the lesson. And that could be a speaking task or a writing task. Okay. You can't just leave it by talking about the listening. It must be something that they're going to give output. That will be writing. Okay. So with any of these skills, you have to have output. If you're listening, you've got to give output. If you're speaking, you're giving output. If you're reading, you ought to give output. If you're giving writing, you've got to give output. So we should always have some kind of output in the classroom. We must never just end and say, all right, that's the end of the class. Off you go. There must be some kind of task for them to show their output. This is the lesson consolidation. It shows often if your objectives have been met in your lesson plans. Okay. So here's a listening task example, which you could do at the start of a class. Um, get two students together, um, preferably not two that know each other quite intimately, and ask them to discuss a topic for two minutes. Two minutes is quite a long time to talk. You might say one minute each, and they must talk about um, a hobby, an interesting news item maybe, a favorite meal, a favorite series, favorite music, favorite teacher, favorite subject. Okay, while the partner simply listens. This one's speaking about Kentucky Fried Chicken Donuts served hot, okay? So that might be their favorite food. Um, once the person has finished speaking, the person listening must paraphrase what they have said and not make judgments. Oh, you said you, you spoke too soft, you spoke too short, you, you didn't speak properly. Um, so no judgments or opinions, just paraphrase what was said about their favorite meal. Then analyze the interchange, the two of them together. Um, was the speaking partner able to communicate effectively? Can you say, look, you started off very quiet. I couldn't really understand. And then you got a bit muddled in the middle. And then there were too many pauses. So you could possibly judge them, not judge them, analyze what was said. And then you could say, but you didn't really listen very well because I saw you were looking out the window all the time. You weren't making eye contact with me. You weren't making notes. Okay. So the, what you've given me as your paraphrase was not really what I said. So you can judge each other by in that way. This is an example of an ESL listening rubric. I know this is home language, but you could make this more complex. Um, if you have a look at the different criteria here, it looks at the whole thing about attention. All right. So making eye contact, looking at the teacher. Um, it's also a response that comes into here. It's the ability to answer questions will also be part of the rubric, participation, and not only ask, answering questions, but also asking questions is important. And then you've got none of the time, some of the time, most of the time, all of the time. Those are ways you can analyze it. This is another rubric, active listening rubric. Again, you can see here, um, near, nearing proficiency, proficient in advance or novice. I think if you're home language, most of your students should be proficient at least. And again, if you have a look here, we're looking at the body language, the body position and eyes, the hands. Are they summarizing what the speaker is saying? Are they asking questions and making connections? And there you can see there are all the criteria describing what it is. And there's also assignment information. There's also some kind of outcome. Does not hand in the assignment to hands in and prepare to hand in work in time, appropriate stand. So it's not just the body language, it's also the output that comes from this active listing rubric. So interesting to have a look at that. 
So rate your listening effectiveness. How good are you at listening? You can do this and then ask somebody to check you out. It says almost always is 10 things to look at your, your listening habits. Do you tune out of uninteresting topics? Okay. Do you criticize the speaker? Number two. Number three. Do you react emotionally when someone's speaking? Do you jump to conclusions? I do. I listen ahead. Um, do you listen only for facts? Number five. Do you fake attention? I think I do sometimes as well. Do you get distracted? Are you thinking about something else? Your mind wanders. Do you avoid difficult materials or different subjects? Do you ignore non-verbal messages when the person is making eye contact you or, or um, asking you a question? Do you ignore it? And then do you do waste the difference between your decoding rate and your speaking rate? So you are not concentrating, so you don't decode because you're not listening effectively. Then you can rate yourself all of, on all these questions. Um, if you say almost always, you get two marks. If you say almost never, you get 10. So that means if you have a mark below 70, you need training in listening. Okay, You almost always criticize the speaker. You only get two marks for that. If you've got 70 to 90, you listen well. If you've got 90 and over, you are an extraordinary listener. But don't just leave it at this. Ask your okay your partner to or your mother or your brother to evaluate you as well this is an interesting little image here in the middle um the word listen contains the same letters as the word silent so just remember to listen you often have to be silent as well okay Shh. so check with that your score with your partner your friend let them see if they agree with your score um they can score you and this will give you some kind of feedback um, but you might not be aware of your listening habits, that you're looking past the person, you're not making eye contact, um, and maybe you'll become more attentive to the way you listen as well. Right, listening to hear and not listening to speak. I think we all need to take note of that. So listen up. And time to listen often happens. I'm quickly going to look at resources now. We're still 14, week 4.1. Uh, instructional materials which you could use in your lesson plan design so if you're conducting a listening lesson you've got the pre-listening stage as i said where you draw on previous knowledge and opinions to provide background information on the topic so in your pre-listening stage you've got to actually get the previous prior knowledge so that they will understand what you're speaking about use authentic materials that are relevant to the students that you establish in some kind of context so you can probe prior knowledge and their opinions. Um, make sure that authentic materials relate to their worlds and context. Don't choose materials they've got no understanding of. Um, in a rural area, you wouldn't maybe choose um, modern buildings because they might not understand that. Or if you're in an urban area, you're not going to speak about soil erosion because many people in towns don't know. They might speak about, you can speak about potholes, I think, in either areas um, because I think we all experience potholes or load shedding in our world. Um, internet or no internet, those are things maybe of, of common knowledge and you could probe them as well. So you're going to use questions to determine their knowledge in your lesson plan. What questions are you going to use? What visuals or videos are you going to use to make sure they have got the prior knowledge? Are you going to ask them to share their experiences of potholes or load shedding or internet, whatever it is, or water shortages? Are you going to ask them about their opinions about that? So this pre-listing stage is really quite brief. It shouldn't be more than six minutes, but it's to establish the prior knowledge. And it's not as long as the during listen, listening lesson, because that's where most of the material with the resources will take place. So these are pictures I took last year. Um, and uh, if you look at this, you might wonder where it is. Maybe you think it's Gauteng somewhere. People are cold. But this is at the border in um, the Ukraine when they were leaving last year. This is the people getting together. A lot of students from Nigeria and Ghana had to leave um, because the universities were closing. There's a picture of them, a daughter and a mom who were getting through the border. And there's a woman with a child in one of the refugee places. So that was last year. What about this year? Okay, I went and looked in Newsweek, and it seems like they found three illegal, illegally kept lions in Ranfontein, and the person could face a fine of ten million rand. And yeah, they're looking at the animals too. That seem people are keeping. Yes, interesting. We are, we've really run out of water in PE quite a few times now with the drought. 
but it seems like this is also happening um, in Johannesburg areas with the Rand Water Board, water pouring down the streets, taps dry. You can talk about shortages of water coming out of taps. Here's another one. Um, interestingly enough, again, education. After COVID, South African education is at the crossroads as we enter 2023. So the COVID effect as well. Just interestingly, I've been reading the um, reflections and it seems a lot of you have come from the COVID era. Um, in your undergrad studies, I see a lot of you have had experience of remote teaching, all the difficulties you've experienced. It was quite astounding that this theme seemed to go through many of the accounts I read. So I just know that all of you have experienced the impact of COVID on your learning as well. But there we are, we are still feeling the impact even as we enter. Although they said um, we had an 80% um, metric rate, um, pass rate last year, um, even with COVID, Let's just see if we can maintain that and the standard of learning can go, can continue to increase. So let's listen, let's think of pre-listening examples. Um, it's following instructions. So for instance, you're going to have a listening lesson, have some instructions at the start so the students know what to do. So you might give them a few rules. You're not allowed to talk to each other. I'm only going to repeat the, 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 the passage once or twice or three times. Um, I'm going to do this TED Talk video now. Um, you will listen to the first minute and then you're going to answer questions on that. Okay, whatever the rules might be. Um, so there's some of the rules. Silence, you can't talk. I'm going to repeat once, twice, three times. No questions or only questions when I'm finished. You can give them those rules. Look at your own work. Don't, or no, you can look at your friend's work for the for the first minute. Okay, so you could have these different kinds of rules. Um so we're going to do some example. Remember, this is resources. What I could possibly do this as a pre-listening um, example. Yes, the passage I have got as a teacher. I'm, I'm going to ask them to draw something. So I'm going to give you each an A4 piece of paper. And I'm going to say you're going to have a pencil. And I'm going to repeat each sentence just once or twice. Okay. However, pre-knowledge is needed here. Yeah. I mean, you might think you never need pre-knowledge. Yes, you do, because I'm going to speak about a square. So I need to know my students know what a square is. Okay, SPs, maybe you have to ask, say to them, okay, now draw a square. And you might have to go around and check that everyone can draw a square. You're going to have to speak about a pencil shape. Do they know what a pencil shape is? Can you see about prior knowledge? What do pencil shapes look like? Make sure everyone knows what a pencil shape is, because I'm going to speak about this. Make sure that you would know what horizontal is because I'm going to use this word when I'm reading, okay? Or it's going to come up in the text that is being they have to listen to. What about attached? If something's attached to something, what does that mean? How do you show that the pencil is attached to the square? What about the word vertical? What is vertical as well? So I've got to make sure they've got an understanding of all these words. What about a half moon shape? Do they know how to draw a half moon? Do they know how to, do they know what the word similar means? If they're two similar small circles, will they know what those things are? So they have to have an understanding of all these words. So pre-listening, rules, understanding of the vocab that I'm going to use so that when I use the word square, they know what to do. And then after I've read this to them, post-listening, you can talk about things. Why, is this difficult? Why was it difficult? What would have helped? Then they would have said, man, reading it four times, practicing those what those things were more often, um, what terms confuse them. So you can talk about this before. So if I were reading this to someone, okay, I'm going to read it quickly. At the center of the page is a large square. Think about that in your mind. At the center of the page is a large square. I've repeated this. At the top of the left-hand corner and attached to the square is a pencil shape pointing horizontally to the left. Can you see there's quite a lot of information there? And so you'd have to maybe repeat that sentence. Otherwise, it's going to be totally confusing. The third sentence. Attached to the top right-hand corner is a pencil shape pointing horizontally to the right this time. Quite complex. There are two vertical sticks attached to the bottom of the square. Second paragraph. At the top of the square and attached to it is a large circle. On either side of the circle, to the left and to the right, is a half moon attached to the circle. At the top, inside the circle, are two similar small circles, the half moon below them, 
and another circle below that. Can you see it's quite technical and complex. This is what it should look like. <laughs> it is amazing when you see what they actually draw. So this is quite a fun exercise to show the importance of concepts, how fast you should read. So it could be a nice little preparation for a listing task um, where you ask them to do something fun like this. Okay, obviously it's going to be looking totally different to this little man with the pencil shapes, the, the circles, the half moons, the vertical sticks and so on, what it looks like. Here's another example. Um, it's a floor plan discussion. So you could actually go over a floor plan, what a floor plan looks like. You can say this is how you show a window. That's how you show a door. That's how you show a kitchen. That's the stove. That's the sink. So they can see what a floor plan is so they know exactly what you're talking about. You will talk about left, right, above, below orientation. So if you're looking down aerially at the kitchen, which is what this is, um, how which is left, which is right, which is top, which is below, all right? So this would be another example. You can see all the highlights of yellows are in different areas. Um, Left-hand corner is a waste paper bin. How do you show a waste paper bin? What is a waste paper bin? Uh, what's a filing cabinet? How could you show a filing cabinet aerially? Photocopy machine, how would you show that? How would you show um, a window? How would you show a desk? How would you show flowers on the table? So there's lots of things to think about. How would you show this visually? Okay, so they need those concepts. That's your prior knowledge. You would read this to them. They would try and draw it. It would look something like this. There is the round table. There's the window. There's the door. There's the photocopy machine. There's a filing cabinet. There's a desk and there's a window. So they would draw something like this. It shows you the complexity of very concentrated active listening. Um, but you, I have to an understanding of the preconcepts of the listening as well. Okay, this is my third example. This is a telephone message. I wonder if anybody still gets telephone messages. I think they get WhatsApp messages. The two from of the firm, what the message is, and so on. Um, and you might say to the class, listen to the telephone message and then write it out for attention of the committee secretary. Um, who's it to? Who's it from? What's the date? Uh, what was the time? What was the actual message? And then you could have a message like this. Please tell Mrs. Brown, the secretary, that I hope to attend the executive committee meeting tomorrow afternoon, but I may be arriving late um, as I have an earlier meeting with someone out of town. My name is John Bond. How will they get that all together? You can shorten this for your class. You might just have two sentences. I've noticed when I've done this in class, most of them get the James Bond. It's not James Bond, it's John Bond. They don't get the Mrs. Brown. They don't get the executive committee. Um, they get, it's quite confusing, but it's actually good to do this. Let them listen to each others and then read it again and see how they can fix it up again. So it's quite a nice little task to do and it's quite fun. Okay, those are all pre-listening, preparing them um, with, the, with the different exercises you can do. This is something that you can do for during listening. Let the learners engage with the listening material. They start now listening to the text. They can read, you can read the text or they can read the text once or many times, depending on their proficiency levels. Um, each reading of the text or the recording of the text should have a different type of listening. So with the first listening, the first reading, it could determine how many speakers there were. So that might be your first question. I'm going to read it once. How many speakers are there? They might say one, two, three. Reading two, to identify what speaker two said. Okay, so that's something specific. Reading three, what fra what phrases depicted emotions? Okay, how do you know the lady was upset? Okay, there was tears, she cried, she was um, silent, all the things that could show that or any kind of actions that they might have had. Um, she touched, she, she touched her cheek, she pulled her face, whatever it might have been. So you'll have different tasks for each reading. Then they can listen in sections or pairs to discuss res responses and predictions possibly to what, you, what happened next. They can discuss this in pairs. You've got activities to motivate the learners, such as, as I said, the true false questions, multiple choice, ticking items in this. This could come with reading one, reading two, reading three. So it's, it's a very structured way to listen to the first reading, the second reading, and the third reading. Yes, I love YouTube videos. There's millions that you can use, and this is often for the during listen one, um, how to have a deep voice. Okay, and this is 
the the um actual YouTube link is here. Um, the task could be a quiz, a mind map, or note taking. You can you can actually use this for how to have a deep voice. So they could listen to the YouTube, and then you could have like a type of multiple choice question: how to have deep voice. There's the YouTube. So Caroline Goya is the person who presents it, and there's a multiple choice. There's a true false, true false multiple choice so they could listen to it and they could try and answer those questions and you can let them listen to it again and they can answer it again when the output can be is do you want to have a deep voice okay and there could be the, the oral response to it or why is it important to have a deep voice could be the written response or practice with your friend having a deep voice okay so if you want a deep voice listen to this video the other one is quite an interesting one, uh, a TED Talk 2, our screens make us less happy. So yes, these little screens make us less happy according to the person that's presenting this TED Talk. Um, you could ask them to do a, a, a mind map or you could give them this mind map and they've got to explain why Steve Jobs was put there. So Steve Jobs and some answer to that, why is World of School? part of this and you could go through each of those prompts and explain more and um, Steve Jobs is included in this because he never allowed his kids to have screens in their lives until they were in grade eight uh, I think it was grade 10 the world of school doesn't allow screens until grade 10 what does he say about the 24-hour day and I'm going to show you some slides from the powerpoint uh, from the TED talk and all the aspects here that are included here so the first thing he speaks about is the average 24 hour day. I mean, you can see there's sleep, there's work and commuting, there's survival, there's personal time. He says this is when the magic happens. However, our personal time has been eroded. As you can see in 2017 was that little yellow part was the only time we used for connecting with other people. So you can see personal is when you should be connecting with people and you're only using that little yellow space. So you can see it's becoming smaller and smaller. And the reason for this is our apps Okay, there are some good apps where we spend nine minutes a day on good apps like relaxation, exercise, weather, reading, education, health things. Those are good things. Um, the thing about good apps is that there, there is what he calls a break, a stop on them. They don't go on forever. However, if I if you just look at the bad apps, things like dating, social networking, gaming, Instagram, entertainment, news, web browsing. Sometimes you can spend 27 minutes a day. And I think this is conservative. Okay, I think some people spend hours a day. Um, the problem is, he says that it goes into our personal time. So we're losing out on time there. And if you look at this next slide, he's saying there have to be stopping cues. So he says when you read a newspaper, there is a stopping cue. If you get to the end of the newspaper, you follow it up. If you listen to a series on Netflix, there is a stop. Because it comes to the end of the series, you have to stop. A movie, it has to stop. Um, some things have stopping cubes, but Facebook has no stopping cue. It goes on and on forever, and you can be drawn into it and not stop watching or stop looking all the time. I think gaming's a bit the same. It's addictive, and you can't, there's no stopping cues as well. So he says you've got to have the break, put the break on sometime. You could go on this lovely highway, and you could lean out the window and take a picture with your, your camera on your phone, or you can actually stop the car, put it to the side, walk on the sand, get to the ocean and take that swim. So often in life, we don't. We're on this fast road, this highway. We are taking pictures out the car windows. We are not stopping and interacting because we're so caught up in our screens. So I think all the students will relate to this. I think especially high school kids as well. Here's another tech talk if you like more things like solar eclipses, which I like as, an, as a geography teacher as well. This was one in 2018, I think it was, um, came, went across the U USA. Um, obviously, they, you have to, they have to know what a solar eclipse is. Um, when did it happen? It was I think it was August the 21st, 2018. There is a path that went across, oh, it's 2017. It went from Charlestown all the way across. That's the path of it. But you'd have to have an understanding of all the terms that were used in the actual. So this might be something for FETs. Um, what's an eclipse evangelist? What is the wreath? What is the corona? Because these are words that are used in the actual TED Talk. You could also have a TED Talk notes taking. So you would give them this point form summary, which they would need to complete as they listen to the TED Talk. Uh, you could give that to them. What is What are, what are eclipse glasses? 
um, how long was the solar eclipse? What were the different things? So this is your, your point from summary. Or you could do some kind of mind map or some kind of flow chart. Um, there's your point, there's your, your corona, your, your solar eclipse. Um, the sky was purple and orange. The conditions, talk about the conditions, talk about the timing, and then you could extend the, the flow chart explaining what each of those things mean. How's that for the plane going through the corona of the sun during that, that solar eclipse? And there is the click to get to the TED Talk. Should you be interested in that? But this is the kind of things you could do using visuals, using note-taking, using discussion of terms to create that prior knowledge. Post-listening stage, um, they say you should repeat the text reading before discussing the answers. So listen to the TED Talk again, and then they can check the answers, and then you can discuss them as well. Um, then also discuss the learner's answers. They can look at each other's. They can do the self-monitoring and checking as well. You can review any kinds of problems they encounter. Oh, man, that was so boring. Or, no, my I, I don't have, I, my personal time is all with my family. I I never use screen time. I've got no, I've got, I don't need a stopping cue because I just know when to stop, okay? You can talk about all those things. Um, then you've got to have a, complete a task for reinforcement. This is your consolidation task. Um, and this could be something that you're going to have a role play of speaking, personal response to the topic, um, or it could be something that you're going to write, like you can explain a quotation from the text, complete that point form summary. This is what the lesson plan for SB will have to do, a point form summary, predict the ending, a different ending, propose a different ending, make a recommendation, those things can be for writing. That is your consolidation task, which you need for the post-listening stage. So when you're conducting a listen lesson, when you're conducting a listening lesson, um, all listening lessons or episodes should be exploited in the classroom. So you should encourage listening, encourage them to act, to interact with each other, to listen to each other, to respond to them, to show their understanding by responding to what they are saying, um, and then have lots of communicative activities to create moments of genuine listening that they have to listen. For instance, when they describe their favorite meal or their favorite series. Even Saron Ramaphosa listens very intently. Can you see why would you say he's listening? I think he's making eye contact. He's leaning his head towards the speaker. His finger here shows that he's pondering, evaluating what has been said. And there he is again. Yeah, he's not really making much eye contact, so I'm wondering if he's really listening, and maybe his, his hands are over his mouth to show that he doesn't really believe what the person is saying. But he's leaning towards him, so that does show a positive look about him, so we can evaluate the way people listen. IELTS is also great if you're looking for listening tasks, and um, they're free, and there's the site that you can go on to. They have a listening one, two, three, and four, which are different complexities. Um, there's also reading practice tests there. There's also writing practice tests and there's also speaking practice tests. So go to the IELTS site, it's great for you. If you have a look at their, their listening part one, this is conversation, social conversation that you can listen to, two people speaking um, and the questions about it on the IELTS site. The section two is a single speaker speaking, it's a monologue and it's in a non-academic situation. It might be someone in a hotel or in a bus or something like that, any questions with it. Section three, it becomes more difficult, conversation with four speakers in an academic topic. So it might be in a lecture theater or teacher asking questions. Um, then the questions on that, the last one is a university style lecture or talk and the questions on that as well. So you can see it becomes more complex. So if you just want an SP, you might just look at the section one, missing part one, where it is a, social or semi-official context, um, or it's a non-academic conversation in section two. Yeah, that's all. Thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> it's a bit long, but we've combined the resources and the listening, and um, the instructional materials are there. My next one, 4.2, is going to be about speaking. I don't think it's as long as this one, so bear with me. Okay. Have a good day. It's Sunday. Have a lovely day in PE. Um, I hope you also know a lovely day where you are, and we'll chat during the week. So I'm going to end off now. Bye for now. Stop my share. End.